name is Diana and I'm a league bowler. I um, don't get to bowl that much, but I'm actually trying to bowl a little more, take my game to the next level and bowl more tournaments. And I just had some questions about trying to better my game. Um, one of the main things I hear all the time is in order to better your game, you have to go out and practice, 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 practice. Well, that sounds good, but if you don't know what to practice and how to practice, I could be hindering my game more than I could be advancing my game. So I just want to know what some, some of the things I should do to, when I'm out there practicing. We see this quite often. People just go out and practice and they're just throwing balls and balls and expect that they're going to get better. And it doesn't work that way. It just ingrains what you're doing now a little bit more. So your inconsistencies actually possibly can get ingrained more defined and then it's going to be harder to break them down the road. So we really like to say that what your practice, you want to have a specific thing that you're working on. And that would be the one thing. We want to take away score or anything, whether it's a cross step, uh, a push away drill, a balance drill. Just break it down in little segments about every 15 minutes. Don't go any farther. We don't like to see them go any farther than 15 minutes, correct? Right. And I, I typically want them to start with spares. So I, you know, they may just, you know, shoot a bunch of 10 pins, 7 pins, whatever it is. And then next I look at trying to give them something to work on skill wise that'll help their versatility. So maybe it's, cha you know, working on versatility with their release or with their ball speed. And the last thing is sometimes it's really smart to kind of find a way to separate what you're working on and practice just competing. So probably the first half of it, let's not keep score. And then the last tail end of it, go ahead and turn the lights on, turn, go ahead and keep score. So you find a way to just separate working on something and competing so that we don't bring that into the, the, the competition realm. But when you're when you are practicing, be specific about what you want to work on. Make sure that you write it down. You can even have it on index card on the table and stuff. And don't be judgmental on any other part of your game. Where we run into a lot of times people practicing and they're trying to fix everything at once. Right. And they're, let's say they're working on a push away direction. And then they worry because they missed their target or anything like that. You need to separate it. We only want to work on that one thing. And try to keep it in small bits, like 15 minutes, Kim's saying. The attention span is going to go. Take a little break if you want to work on it some more and then come back to it or pick something else out. And then when you go for a score of the competition, then don't be judgmental on what you're working on. They're, whatever you do, we're there to knock down pins. Okay. That's very helpful because we, we do get so caught up in, like you said, if we're just supposed to be working on the push away, then if I miss my mark, then I'm trying to figure out, well, what can I do to better hit my mark? So I think that's a good point is that if you had a liability to push away and you're trying to correct it, you will be missing your mark because prior to that hit your mark, you had to readjust your swing. And if you're fixing your push away now, it's not going to be going where it used to go. So you should be missing your mark. And don't worry, that will come back. But if you try to hit the mark, you're going to lose all you gain with working on the push away. Thank you. And the other question I had is uh, we're so quick um, to change balls. We believe everything is the ball reaction, we're not getting the ball reaction we want, we should change balls. And in return, in the reality of it for the everyday average bowler, it's really our, we're so inconsistent with our release. So what do you recommend I can do or people out there can do to be more consistent on working on the release so it's not so much that we're blaming the ball so much that it is really just us not releasing the ball the same way? A lot of times the problem with releasing the ball the same way is going to be a fit. It's going to be a grip pressure and a fit. And an example that we try to use in here is that I want you to squeeze your fist as tight as you can and we'll call that a 10. And then keep your hand as relaxed as much as possible and call that a zero. Our goal is to try to be somewhere about a three or a four of our grip pressure between those two points. A lot of players are somewhere in the six or sevens, you know, going a little tighter to the gripping. And the more you have to grip it, the more you have to let the ball go instead of having roll off your hand. So a lot of the inconsistencies for the release it comes just because of the grip pressure required on that bowling ball. Right, and, and you know, that release is a kind of a byproduct or an end result of doing other things properly. So a lot of times when we're trying to fix our release, we're trying to force a change there that doesn't typically hold because there's something else happening that's making it result in that. So it, it could very well be something that's happening at the start. We talk a lot about the game and how it's such a cause and effect. And if you're not getting a good start, you know, talking about the push direction or the shape of that push away, it'll, it'll show up as a release inconsistency. If you're bowling balls too, if you're using inserts, make sure you have fresh inserts. You know, change them two or three times a season. Uh, 
if the inserts start getting more, then you start losing the feel, and now the thumb starts having to have more control. So let's say we were at about a 70 on the fingers and 30 on the thumb. As the inserts start wearing, all of a sudden now we're 60-40, 50-50. Now the thumb's starting to dominate a little bit more than it should be, and the inserts don't look like they're really wore, but try to get them fresh at least two or three times a year. Change that tape in that thumb hole so that it's fresh. So a lot of it could be just a little bit over time that the inserts are wore out. Okay. And then the other part is, again, I guess it would be part of the release is I, I know for me and looking at other people, the longer you keep your thumb in the ball, a lot of it, you're killing the rotation of the ball. You hear you're killing the rotation of the ball. But then when you're out there watching people roll and you're thinking that they're really using their thumb to rotate the ball. And in reality, the thumb should be the first thing out the ball. So what would you recommend on getting people to learn how to get their thumb out the ball faster or, um, so they're not quite holding on to it for so long? I think that gets into the, what we just kind of talked about, either controlling it with the thumb and the grip. Really, the thumb is just in there so the ball doesn't fall off in the backswing. You know, there's all, the utility of the thumb when it comes to your ankle is gone. You know, it just helps support the bowling ball. And then we want to use the rest of our hand to roll it. So we would like to see that thumb exit somewhere around your ankle to maybe just barely pass the ankle and then let the hand and fingers continue on to get the ball to roll. We don't want to use the thumb to turn the ball at all. The turning the ball is going to be all the risk because no matter how I turn, my thumb's going to be in the same place. And I think really recognizing that we really want the lane to do much more of the work than, than likely what's happening when folks have their hand in the ball too long, when their thumb's in it too long, that they're trying to generate higher rev rate and, and create more axis or less axis rotation, and they're doing it more with grip pressure and with their hand rather than letting the lane get the, letting the ball hook, you know, using the friction on the lane, and they're trying to do it with their hand. That's the least... That's the worst way to do it. And you'll see players too, the thumb becomes so dominant because the swing is extremely steep because they're pulling down from the backswing. And then all the momentum is taking that ball into the, the floor, so they're worried about dropping it, so then you have to grab it. So on something like that, just relax and let the swing drop. I mean, the release will happen. You're not going to stop it. It's going to actually roll through that process, a thumb out, palm, and then the fingers out. But you got to let it happen. That wants the patience. You know, just let the swing drop and the release will take care of itself. Okay. And then one of the things that I'm, you know, trying to do as far as taking the game to the next level, especially now that the women's bringing their tour back, um, and just trying to get to the next level, like what would you recommend for someone to try to prepare to get ready to go and, and see where they're at, I guess, when it comes to the women that are out there that actually does this for a living versus, you know, the average everyday kind of bowler. So what would you recommend for someone to get prepared for a tournament like this? You know, I think that, that very much you want to make sure that you're comfortable in all areas of the lane. You know, be able to play up the lane from the gutter all the way into 2025 because, you know, depending on what patterns they put out and how challenging they are, we know they're going to be pretty tricky, I'm sure, in their sport patterns. Really being careful with all, comfortable with all angles. Um, Versatility is important, having the ability to change your ball speed from softer to faster and being accurate and consistent with that is, those are things that I would practice. Um, understanding my equipment, making sure I understand how to manage the surfaces on those and how they make a difference and how the ball's gonna go down the lane. Yeah, it's gonna be stress and what the ball, you can do with the bowling ball, but it becomes a point that you're working on your physical game to make it more consistent. And then on the next stage, your versatility. So you're picking one area that you're trying to change and see what difference is going to be, whether it's ball speed, your hand more on the side of the bowling ball, more up the back, different variables. So I think key is get your A game really good. And don't worry about these B or C games. Just find little tweaks that you can just change things minutely. I think a lot of bowlers get tied up into the A game and then the B game and stuff. Right. It's all one game, and it just you want to have it consistent, and you want to be able to have adjustments or variables to change that parameters a little bit, whether it's the ball, the ball surface, your hand pressure, your grip pressure, how the ball's releasing off your hand, more on the side, more on the back, or the speed, how fast you're throwing the ball up, or, you know, speeding up or throwing it slower. So that repeatability, and you know, I, I can remember when I was bowling pretty regularly, you know, I think it's important to know what makes your game work. Knowing, you know, if things go bad, if you start throwing it not, not the way you want and getting into trouble, to know what home base is, where you need to be in the stance, where the ball needs to start, what the, 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 the shape of your push weight is supposed to look like. So things kind of start to go awry, like, let me just get back to what I know so that my repeatability is reliable and then I can then make some educated decisions about where I want to be on the lane and what balls I want to use. One of the tricks you can do to help your repeatability is do it with a plastic ball on the house condition so you're taking the lane out of play. Okay. 
So that way the lien doesn't help you or give you a false indication that you're being consistent because the lane will help pull it in and we're not trying for score we're just trying to repeat the shot and be able right. to play different parts of the lane and it's not a bad thing to do it with a plastic ball because all you're trying to do is control your launch angles going through the front okay very helpful and i guess the one thing that i get a lot is you know with youth bowlers or even someone that's just beginning to learn how to bowl because it seems like it's you know becoming more of a family game and is is it easier to start someone with starting at the line with just a swing or you know because everybody wants to take the ball and just run to the line and then stop and throw it so what would be the best way to teach somebody who is just starting I mean is it easier just to start them at the line and you know get them familiar with the swing and the release or actually do the steps with the push out you know the push away and everything else well I, I think there's obviously it, it depends on the player I think you know uh, there's some people that are just going to if their athleticism really allows them to you know get their feet moving and the swing at the same time and they can get there in kind of a balanced fashion then you know certainly start them from back there you just want to give them an indication or help them understand where how far away from the foul line they want to be if you have other folks that just can't get used to the feel of, of how the ball is supposed to come off their hand and folks that want to throw it more than roll it, they're probably good candidates of, of doing more one-step drills and getting them to just feel their thumb exit and then their fingers roll after it. Yeah, it makes a big difference whether they have their own shoes or not or if they have their own bowling ball drill or they're just strictly house shoes and a house ball. But I think sometimes when we're training, especially you get into advanced youth, I mean by advanced, older youth that actually play other sports in athletic or even adults, we try to get in too much of a system of robotics. We end up one, two, three, four, which is, I think, the wrong way to go. I think we want to use their natural rhythm, their natural athleticism, the flow. The hard part with bowling is it's an unnatural movement for the start because when you swing your right arm forward, generally when you're walking, your left foot goes forward. Well, in bowling, we want the right foot and the right, if you're right-handed, and the ball to go at the same time. So it's an uncomfortable, unorthodox athletic move to start. At the finish, it's exactly what we want because you have the left foot going forward and the right arm coming down. So it's a very natural move, but it starts at a very unnatural position. So that's the hardest part, I think, working with people is getting that start because you'll take anyone who hasn't bowled before. They want to push the ball out and the left foot at the same time. And that's why you see a lot of three steps out because that's how we walk. But if we can get them to get that start, and doesn't have to, they don't have to get fixed, balanced, just get the ball and go, just get moving. And if we can get that right foot and the right hand going at the same time, it will bring itself into sync going up to the foul line. Okay, so with all that being said, is there an advantage or disadvantage to, you know some people have a four-step approach versus a five-step approach. Is there an advantage one way or the other? I don't think so. I mean, I think we certainly see more five-step deliveries these days than four-step, but it's really it's it's personal it's whatever makes sense to you whatever you know some people used to call that when we'd go to five step like a timing step or they you know i think when i remember they used to say well that's the way you can generate more ball speed yes. so you know we had I hear that a lot yeah if the tempo doesn't increase it doesn't generate more ball speed you know it just gives you a little farther and a little distance and it's not i mean we've had junior bowlers that had seven or eight step approaches because they're little they're trying to get up the approach they're trying to generate some swing it's not bad. Four is going to be the basic that we're going to be looking at, but okay. five, six, or seven, whatever rhythm they have some consistency and a flow. I think that's more important, having rhythm as opposed to the robotics, worrying about timing or getting that. We want to look at balance and rhythm. Okay. Well, Rod and Kim, I appreciate it. It's been very, very helpful, and I hope to be able to apply this from here on out. Thank you.